All right. It is Thursday night, the second Thursday night of August, and it is time for No More Genies. I'm waiting on Periscope to pop up. Uh, so welcome to my Facebook Live. There is Periscope. Welcome to my Facebook Live audience, and welcome to my Periscope audience. So what's my tagline? My tagline is, God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his prophets. That's right. You need the prophetic voice in your life. Now, uh, if you want to support me, you can support me in several ways. Uh, there's a PayPal me link on Facebook Live and in my Periscope profile. Uh, and uh, also it's on my Twitter feed. So you can give donations do, uh, through the PayPal.me link. Remember that Prophet David Taylor NFP is um, a 501c3, so your contributions are tax deductible. You can also uh, support me through Amazon Smile. If you're not familiar with Amazon Smile, Amazon Smile is a website through Amazon to where you can log on and then you can choose a charity, a 501c3, and then a portion of the money you spend during that uh, shopping excursion will go to that charity. So you can support me through Amazon Smile. So that link is also on uh, Facebook Live. Then also, uh, you can support my music. I'm setting up a Patreon for Prophet David Taylor and Shades at the Cross, and I'm going to get some stuff on iTunes. I know I've been talking about that for a while, but I am doing it. Uh, so for those of you that want to support me, thank you for asking, and that's how to do it. Okay, now how and where can you find me? I always hashtag everything I do with hashtag PDT. Okay, hashtag PDT. So that's the fastest way to find me online. Just look up hashtag PDT and you can find my stuff because I know there's other you know ministers out there named David Taylor. Okay, my reg regular broadcast is on Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time every Sunday. Except if I'm like out of town, like last week and I was out of town, or if I'm at a convention or something and I can't, you know, do it in the moment. And then second Thursdays, that's tonight, a very specific teaching that's called No More Genies. And I hashtag that with hashtag NMG. And No More Genies is where we are addressing genie concept. We are addressing the wrong concept of God, the genie concept of God. That concept, concept is incorrect. So that's the teaching I'll be working on tonight. This is actually my fourth teaching of No More Genie, so you can hashtag NMG and look it up, hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG, and you can find all four teachings, uh, including tonight, on No More Genies, okay? All right, so uh, just a brief recap, genie concept is when you think of God as a genie, when you think of him as magic, when you think that faith is magic, when you think that all you have to do is say the magic word or rub a lamp and God's just going to do what you want him to do, that's genie concept. Okay, and the reason that I felt led and compelled to teach on this is because genie concept has messed up a lot of people, both saints and sinners alike. A lot of people believe in the genie concept of God. A lot of people just, just think you can rush into God's presence with no relationship with him and just do a dance and do the hokey pokey and stick your left foot in and your right foot out and then turn it all about. Or say the magic word or rub the lamp and shazam, you're going to get like this miracle or whatever. And then if it doesn't happen that way, then people get mad at God and they say he's not real and he doesn't care and he doesn't love you. And the devil's just having a field day because then the devil's going to move into your heart with bitterness, anger and resentment to keep you away from the relationship with the true and living God that you need. Okay, so that's why I felt compelled to teach on no more genies so that we can fully purge ourselves as Christians of genie concept. And so that you can explain to people that don't know God that it doesn't work like a genie concept, but you've got to be delivered from that first. Okay. All right. Uh, I went to the just so you know, I went to the global uh, leader summit at Willow Creek today and it was powerful, man. It was so powerful. Uh, Bishop Jakes was there, and I, I saw him live, and Carl Harris, and uh, it was it was so powerful. There was a lot of good things going on. So uh, check that out uh, as well. Check out some of those videos or check out some of the GLS hashtags on Twitter because there's a lot of solid principles 
of leadership um, that you can find there if you're not able to attend. All right, so we're going to dive into tonight's lesson. Tonight's lesson is entitled The What Versus The How, but there's actually a lot more that I'm going to say, but, you know, I had to, I couldn't make the title everything I'm going to say because then it would be super, super long. Wait, let me see if I can change the angle there. Good, right. So we're going to dive in tonight and talk about the what versus the how. Now, let's say a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you, God, for this teaching. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the grace we stand in by faith in Christ. Thank you for your unmerited favor. I ask, oh God, that you be in. We invite you in, Lord. We invoke your presence on this broadcast that you be in the midst, oh God, of what is said, that you might guide my mouth in all things, that the Spirit of God would speak through me, and that you would have said what you want said, so that you might get the glory in all things, so that the body of Christ might be edified, and so that we can give correct information to unbelievers, so both saints and sinners alike have the right concept of you, so that all can be saved and have a relationship with you, and have, walk with you, and talk with you, and have the relationship that you desire. And we thank you for it, and we believe you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. So, we're going to start with some examples that shows you how if God promise you, promises you something, what God is promising you is the what. If God says, I'm going to do this, or this is going to happen, that's what, Okay. But God does not let you lock him into a method, into a how, okay? If, if you're claiming a promise from God or you get a word from the Lord and the Lord says, this is going to happen, that's the what, okay? But you can't lock God into a method of how, how it's going to happen. And that's what we keep trying to do. We keep trying to tell God, not only do I want you to bless me, but I want you to bless me this way. OK, and many times when you go before God and you ask him for something, hey, God bless you, Victoria. God bless you. Thank you. Many times when you go before God and you ask him for something, you not only have a picture in your head of that thing you're asking him for, but you also have a picture of the way. The way God is going to get it to you. And that is genie concept. That is dangerous. That has messed a lot of people up. Because you think it has to happen a certain way. And I have to say that over the course of my life, I have heard many people, many clergy, many clerical people, many people in spiritual leadership, when they give their testimony, they tell you what God did, and then they tell you how he did it for them. But then people get the false idea that God is going to do it that way for you. And I don't think I've heard that uh, any more often than with spouses and with money. So let's start with money. I've heard people get up in the pulpit and say, we needed X amount of money for this project or for church expansion or whatever. And I didn't have but X amount of dollars and I knew that wasn't enough. So the Lord told me to sow that X amount of dollars I had. So I needed a million dollars, and I didn't have but $10,000, and that wasn't enough, no way, but that was my vacation money. So I was getting ready to go on vacation and feel sorry for myself because I couldn't expand the church, and then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to sow that $10,000. And within one week, I had a million dollars in my account. Look at God. Okay, now. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people say that. Preachers, clergy from the pulpit. What happened was they did what the Lord said do. That doesn't mean that God is going to do it that way for you. You have to seek his face and ask him. Ask him if you want more money than you have right now. You have to ask the Lord, what is your financial plan for my life? And then you've got to find out what he's saying to you. Because he may not be saying that to you. Or if he is telling you to give a sacrificial seed, uh, notice in that testimony, the preacher didn't tell you how he got that money. That's the part that always just, just gives me a headache. They didn't talk about their credit rating. They didn't talk about did they borrow that money. They didn't talk about did it come in through donations. Uh, like, like did the church pay tithes and offerings? Did they give like a love offering? 
Did they have someone that was a, a wealthy benefactor? Uh, did they win a settlement? Did they inherit something from a relative? I mean, they didn't give you any details as to how the money got in the account. They just made it seem like, like magic. I sold a sacrificial seed, and the next thing I knew, I had my million dollars. Yeah, see? You didn't get no details. And if you walk away just armed with that, then you might think if I go out and I sow my vacation money or I sow the money that I got saved up, that God is going to answer me the way he answered them. And that is not true. That is not true. You, real, you will reap what you sow, but you need to seek the face of God and ask the Lord, what is your plan for me? Because sometimes God's answer is get better at your job. I know some of y'all haven't heard that your whole Christian life. Your whole Christian life, they've been telling you, just sow a seed, sow a seed. That's the first part of the process. That's not the only part of the process. That's not the only way God comes, okay? Because sometimes God's answer to you is get better at your career. That's how you're going to get more money. Become worth more to the marketplace, because sometimes you can sow and sow and sow and sow and it looks like you're not getting a harvest. And then you're going to get upset. Do you know why you might not be getting a harvest? Because the f level of finances you want to get on, your skills and your productivity isn't up to that level. That's why you're not reaping on that level. Because once again, what you're expecting is manna. You think it's just going to fall out the sky or because you heard so-and-so preachers say, I did this and the Lord did that or whatever. They didn't give you no details. So now you think like magic, <laughs> if pastors say that happened for him, then Monday when you check your bank account, like magic, is going to be a million dollars in it. No, it don't necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily going to happen that way because sometimes the answer is get better at your job. Sometimes that's how you're going to reap your harvest. Get your skills up to the financial level you want them to be on. That's how you're going to get on that financial level, okay? Whatever it is you do for a living, 10 exit. You ever think about that? If you make $30,000 and you want to make $300,000, that means you have to 10x your value to the marketplace. That means that whatever you do for a living, the marketplace values that at $30,000. If you want to make $300,000, you have to take your $30,000 level and 10x what you do and become worth 10 times more. And you can so for a lot of people, that's how you're going to reap your harvest. I know some of y'all ain't never heard that your whole entire life. And that's why some of y'all have been waiting for years on manna to fall out the sky and it hasn't happened. Because you didn't ask the Lord, what do you want me to do to go to another financial level? What do you want me to sow? How do you want me to sow? When do you want me to sow? Where do you want me to sow? Because the Lord is a person, not a genie. Because God is a person, not a set of rules. Okay? All right. Now, let me give you another example. Because I, I thought of another example while I was talking. So the first example I told you was uh, spouses. Second one, money. We dealt with money first. Now we're going to deal with spouses. When you hear people give their testimony about how they found their spouse, I want you to listen to more than one person because you will discover it's different every time. Some people grew up with a person they end up marrying, and like, you know, they've known them since they were kids. Some people knew them in high school, married all the wrong person, came back around at 65, found them on Facebook again and said, you was the right one. We should have got married a long time ago. Some people, like one of my cousins, God told them to move to another city. And God told them, when you move to this other city, your spouse is in that city. OK, some people you meet at, 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 at marriage conferences like you go there with the idea of finding a spouse. Some people meet on dating websites. OK, ain't no one way to meet a spouse. And when you listen to people give their testimony about how they met their spouses, you can't get it in your head that God's going to do it that way for you. If God promised you a spouse, he will do it. But he, he's not going to be locked into a method 
of doing it for you the way he did it for other people. And that's the danger of genie concept. When you think that you're going to get to tell the Lord how he has to bless you, you going to be upset and disappointed. <laughs> huh? Because ain't no one way to meet a spouse. Ain't no one way to meet a spouse. There ain't no one way to meet a spouse. Some people meet their spouses in high school and miss them and come back around later. Some people meet their spouses in college. Okay? Some people meet their spouses on missions trips. I've heard people give testimonies that they were going uh, somewhere to do some missions work. And there was another group, or they went with a group of people, and in that group, they found someone that they were attracted to. So what they did while they were doing missions was they spent some time talking to a person in a group setting, so you're not going to be alone, So you you know, because you're always tempted to get over into fornication. That's one of the easiest things to do. So they just talked to them out in the open, in public, in a group setting, got to know them, and they say things like, I got to hear their heart. They got to hear who they were on the inside, and they said, I think we're a good fit. I think we're a good match. I think we can build a life together. Sometimes on missions trips, okay? Ain't no one way. And when you listen to people give their testimony about how God brought this person in my life, and they don't give you any details, or they do give you details, and then you think it's going to happen that way for me, yeah, mm-mm. It don't have to happen that way for you. If God promised it, promised it to you, it will happen. But it doesn't have to happen that way. Okay? Uh, let me give you this last one on spouses and I'll move on to the next one. Sometimes the reason that your spouse has been delayed is because God is trying to get you to a certain place before you get married. That's what happened to Joseph. Remember that Joseph in Genesis had a vision at the age of 17 about how God was going to lift him up and his family was going to be bowing down to him. That was 17. So in our system, that would make him a junior or a senior in high school. Then Joseph got sold into slavery by them same brothers. And then Joseph was up and down in Egypt. He worked in Potiphar's house and then he got a false rape accu accusation. Then he went to jail. Joseph was up and down in Egypt for 13 years. <laughs> and, and God didn't get Joseph out of jail and bring him before Pharaoh until Joseph was 30 years old. And then Joseph got married. Okay. So sometimes uh, the reason there's been a delay for some people in getting the spouse, even though God has promised you a spouse, is because there's a certain place God is trying to get you before you get married, before he brings that person in your life. And that's different for different people because everybody's not the same. Because you are a person made in the image of God who is a person. He has a, he has a specific plan and will for you. That's why you have to seek his face and ask him, what is your will for me? You can't be looking at other people. I knew a man who told me that he had known his wife since they were five. They went to kindergarten together. I was like, wow. Like they met in kindergarten. Wow. Wow. Everybody don't have that experience. He said, I have known my wife since we were very small children. We met uh, in kindergarten. And then he said they started dating around 14 and 15 and got married, I think, like in their early 20s. You can't, you can't make it happen that way for you. It happened that way for them. So if God promised you a spouse, he will, because God cannot break his word, he will deliver you a spouse. But you can't tell him how. Because there might be some things he wants to do in your life first before you get married. Third one I'm going to talk about is healing good, googly muggly. And I'm going to go to the scripture on this. Healing. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people give their testimony about how God healed them. And then the people that hear that get it in their head that God going to heal me that way. Okay, God has promised his healing. By his stripes, we were healed. Jesus took the stripes when he got beat and he took the nails and shed his blood on the cross to pay for our healing. But how the Lord heals you, and I'm going to show you this one from the scripture. Okay, now before I do that, let me look up this story because this story is coming to mind. 
and I'm going to give you a real life example right now today of how Genie Concept has messed some people up so that you understand I'm not making this up. Here we go. Uh, you can look this up on CNN, Huffington Post, you can look this up anywhere. Tatiana Fusari told cops the couple noticed that their baby was not well, but declined to get medical help partly for religious reasons. This is a couple in Michigan. They are now facing charges of felony murder and first degree child abuse for the child's death. I'm not making this up. Seth Welch's jaw dropped open during his arraignment in Kent County on Monday as a judge informed him that the charges carried a potential his life sentence. And wife are uh, beside him, his wife, Tatiana Fusari, wept openly. The Christian, there it is. The Christian couple's 10-month-old daughter, Mary Welch, was found dead in her crib in the couple's Salon Township home on August 2nd. The police officer who responded to Welch's emergency call noted in his report that Mary's cheeks and eyes were sunken into her head. An autopsy later determined that the child died from malnutrition and dehydration, dehydration due to neglect by adult caregivers. Uh, the sheriff's office ruled the death a homicide and the parents were arrested on August 3rd. The couple, both 27 years old, remain in jail without bond. Okay, I'm reading this off Huffington Post so you can go read it right now. There, that's what I'm talking about. There it is in real life right now today. So you don't, so you understand, I'm not making this up. So you understand why I'm so passionate about teaching about Genie Concept. There it is right now in real life today. A couple that said for religious reasons, whatever, we're not going to take care of the child. <laughs> we're just going to let the Lord heal it. We're going to let the Lord do it. Excuse me. If you have a baby, you need to feed the baby. Uh, if the woman, if the mom is still lactating, you nurse the baby. You have to make sure the baby has water. The baby's hydrated. There's a lot you have to do to make sure your infant child is okay. And if your infant child is not well, of course you want to pray and plead the blood and claim God's word over your child. And then you might have to get your behind to the hospital. Did we mention that God invented hospitals? Okay. Did we mention that you can't tell God how to heal your child. You got to do your part in the natural. Sometimes the Lord's answer is go to the hospital. Sometimes the Lord's answer is take your medicine. Okay? You can't lock God into one way of doing things. And this couple, then let their baby die. Now they're finna go to jail for the rest of their life. And they can't believe it. Do you know why? Because of genie concept. Because they thought they could just say a magic word or... Just do whatever and tell the Lord how he has to heal the child. Now the baby's dead. Now the police reports say it's malnutrition and dehydration. And now the mom and daddy finna go to jail for the rest of their life. And they're 27 years old. You know why that's finna happen? Because of genie concept. There it is right now. In living color right now today. Having these wrong ideas about God will mess you up. Okay, they will mess you up and end you up with dead kids and a life sentence in prison. Because instead of doing what you need to do in the natural, which is making sure that your child has food and water. And if you're the mama, if you're still lactating to nurse your child, because there is no better food on earth for infants than human breast milk. That's been proven over and over and over again. That there literally is no better food for babies than mama's breast milk, okay? You got to do your part in the natural. <laughs> make sure your child is, you know, stabilized. Uh, and they won't let the child out of the hospital. And make sure the temperature in your house and make sure your house is as germ-free as you can make it. And there's a whole lot you have to do. You can't just sit back and not do anything as a parent and say, the Lord going to hear my child because now that baby's dead and the parents is facing a life sentence. I'm not making that up. I just read it for you. Look it up on Huffington Post. You'll see. Okay? So let's go to the scripture. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Genie concept has messed people up. Okay? Let's go to the scripture. We're going to go to 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14. This story is about the leprosy of Naaman. 
okay? 2 Kings, that's in the Old Testament, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Now Naaman was commander, of, I'm reading out of the NIV, by the way, New International Version. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had, had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, wow, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel said, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, the prophet, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Now watch what Naaman does. Verse 11. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Wow. Naaman said, I wanted something dramatic. <laughs> Naaman said, I want something out of a movie. I want Elijah to come out and say, in the name of Jebus, heal this man's leprosy. Okay. And then, then Naaman goes, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. What did Naaman do? He turned down the word of God because he didn't like the way it came. He didn't like the instructions. Naaman had a picture in his mind of how he thought the prophet had to heal him. Naaman was like, well, this going to go this way. Elijah going to come out. He going to stand and he going to look at my leprous spot. He going to wave his hand. He going to say the magic words and woo, I'm going to be healed. That ain't what happened. Elisha didn't even come out the house. Elisha sent a messenger to tell Naaman, go dip in uh, the Jordan, and then you'll be cleansed. And Naaman got angry. He said, well, I don't want it that way. I think it's going to happen that way. And he would rather stay a leper than do what the prophet told him to do. Look at that. Does that tell you something? Doesn't that tell you how so many people have missed their healing from God because you didn't bother to get instructions from God as to how he was going to heal you? You just assumed. You just assumed it was going to go like that picture in your head. You just assumed it had to happen a certain way. How many people have stormed away from God because he didn't do it the way you thought he should do it? And you still sick. <laughs> you don't have to be sick. But you got to do what the Lord says do because he is a person, not a set of rules. Because he is a person, not a genie. You don't get to go to God and just say a magic word and wave your hand and tell God how he has to do something. Because God don't follow you. You follow him. God don't obey you. You obey him. God don't bow down before you. You bow down before him. That's how it works. And if you don't like that, and you don't do what the Lord say do, you're going to stay sick and broke and lonely and all the things you don't want to be if you don't do it the way the Lord say do it because he's a person, okay? Verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? 
So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Look at that. So Naaman had to repent of his drama. <laughs> he had to repent of his rage, and he had to repent of thinking that he could get his healing the way he thought it was going to happen. And he had to do what the Lord said do through the mouth of the prophet. And if he hadn't repented, he would have stayed a leper. What does that tell you? See, because genie concept messes people up. Okay, I'm going to show you a few more places in the scripture. Okay, in John, the gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 6, that's when Jesus made some clay from some uh, spit. He spit on the ground. Jesus spit on the ground, made some clay, made some salve with that spit clay and put it on the blind man's eyes. And the Lord healed him that way. That's John chapter 9, verse 6. But in John chapter 5, verse 8, there was a man that had been sick for 38 years. All the Lord did there was, he said, rise, take up that bed and walk. The Lord didn't touch him. The Lord didn't make any clay. He just spoke it. And the man got up. Now, in Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Mark, second book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, uh, chapter 5, verse 41, there was a funeral for a little girl, and, and uh, they were in the house. And uh, they were, you know, the professional mourners, they were weeping and wailing because everybody was sad that this little girl had died. And the Lord came to the house, and the Lord said, why are you guys crying? The damsel isn't dead. She's just sleeping. And everybody laughed at Jesus. So Jesus put them all out except for his disciples and the girl's parents. And then the Lord took that little girl by the hand and said, Talitha Kumi, which means damsel arise or little girl get up. And that girl came back to life. Raise that girl from the dead. Stop the funeral mourning. But he took her hand and spoke the word. A different method. So in one method, the Lord spit on the ground and made some clay and healed the man. On another method, the Lord just spoke the words. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Another method, raising a child from the dead, he grabbed her by the hand and said, Talitha Kumi, damsel, I say arise, little girl, get up. And in uh, the case of Naaman's leprosy in 2 Kings, God spoke to Elisha and said, go dip in the river seven times. Look at all them different methods. All them people got a physical miracle of healing, but they all got it a different way because God is a person, not a genie. God is a person, not a set of rules. You, it's not a formula. It's not a formula. It's not a formula. You want it so badly to be a formula. I know you do. God's a person. Okay? You have to ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? Which leads me to my next point. Okay? My next point is you have to learn the voice of the Lord. And this is why you need the prophetic in your life. Where does it say that in scripture? Let's look at some scriptures. Okay? Let's look at John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, okay? I'm reading out of the NIV, so this is point number two. Uh, point number one is that you can't lock God into a method. Point number two is that you have to learn God's voice. So let's look at John, the, book, the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so fourth book in the New Testament. We're going to read out of the gospel of John chapter 10, Verses 1 through 5, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, uh, verses 10, 1 through 5, I said that, right? Okay. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Good God Almighty. Look at what the Lord said. The Lord said that he calls his own sheep by name. Jesus Christ knows your name. Mary, Sequoia, Lashonda, Rachel. Adam, Marcia, Mickey, okay, 
Takia, Allen, okay? The Lord knows your name. He knows you by name. You got to learn how to hear his voice because he wants a personal relationship with you. He said right there, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Okay? That's a personal relationship with you and the good shepherd. Okay? So let me throw this point in to, to back this point up. That's why you can't substitute your religious leader for a relationship with God. Your apostle, your prophet, your evangelist, your pastor, and your teacher are not a substitute for your own relationship with God. They're there to help you in your relationship with God, but not to substitute your relationship with God. Your relationship with Christ is between you and him. And even when you sit under the teaching ministry of an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop, deacon, elder, it doesn't matter. They're not there to substitute a personal relationship with God for you. They're there to help you in your relationship with God, but not to be a substitute. You got to know the Lord for yourself because he knows your name. He knows you personally, but you got to get to know him personally. Let's look at another scripture, uh, same gospel, gospel of John, same chapter, uh, verse 10, but this time we're going to look at verses 27 and 28. The Lord makes this statement. He says, John 10, 27 and 28, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Look at that. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. My is a personal pronoun. I is a personal pronoun. They follow me. That's a personal pronoun because the Lord is a person. I, uh, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Okay. That's a personal relationship with the good shepherd. Okay. Uh, now, let me show you some people who don't take seriously what I'm teaching you right now. Let me show you how they're going to end up. Okay. There's a couple of scriptures that talk about people that are Christians, but don't take the time to get to know the Lord, because that's entirely possible. It's entirely possible to be born into God's kingdom and understand him that he died on the cross and you got born again, but you never got to know him personally. That's entirely possible. I know, I know that may sound crazy and some of y'all never heard that in your life, but it's entirely possible. Just like some people give birth to kids and they never really learn who those kids are. It's entirely possible to be in God's kingdom and you don't really know him. You know how I know that? Here's how. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Lord, have mercy. Verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Good gravy from the Navy. The Lord just told you that not everybody that's running around talking about Lord, Lord Jesus is going to enter to the kingdom. But people that are doing, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How do you know the will of the Father which is in heaven? The Lord has to tell you. He has to tell you personally. He has to say, this is my plan for your life. This is what I want you to do with your life. Only Christ can tell you that. Even if he gives you some instruction through the mouth of a prophet, that's not a substitute for your personal relationship with him. You're supposed to spend time with him. You're supposed to get to know his word. You're supposed to get to know his voice. And if you don't, he said, not everybody run around talking about Jesus. Every talk, everybody talking about God don't know him. And everybody singing about heaven ain't going. Okay? 
He said many. What a thing for Jesus to say, because the Lord has access to all the souls that ever were. And he said many. That means there's going to be a whole lot of folk that spent their whole life running around doing a bunch of religious things, and they don't bit more know the Lord than my left shoe. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess to them, the Lord said, I never knew you. Get out my face. We never had a relationship. Then he says, ye that work iniquity. Why is what they did iniquity? Because they made up their own plan and then put Jesus' name on it. Once again, <laughs> that's you trying to tell God how he has to use you. Haven't you ever heard people say that when I grow up, I want to be a preacher? That don't mean God called you to preach. Maybe mama and them called you to preach. <laughs> Maybe you come from a family of preachers and you don't want to be the only one in your family that's not a preacher. Or maybe so many people in church saw your gift, but they mistook your gift. Because not everybody that has a speaking gift is called to, to preach or be a part of the clergy. And not everybody that has a speaking gift is called to be a pastor. Because there's a difference between a pastor and a prophet. I'm a prophet. I'm not a pastor. Okay? And if you have a speaking gift, a speaking gift, you might be an evangelist. You might not be a pastor. Okay? You've got to ask the Lord. What is your will for my life? And if you don't, you're going to make up a bunch of religious things and then try to slap Jesus' name on it and then drag all that religious stuff before the Lord and say, look at all the stuff I did. And the Lord done already told you how he's going to answer you. He's going to say, we never had a relationship. Depart from me. Get out of my face. You worked iniquity. Why is that iniquity? Because you made up your own program and then put the Lord's name on it. You tried to tell God how all this was going to go. You try to tell God how he had to use you. You try to tell God that you was going to decide what your good works in life was going to be. And the Lord said, many, many. That means a whole, uh, that means a whole lot of folks. Okay. A whole lot of folks have been making up a whole bunch of religious things and slapping Jesus name on it. And God ain't bit more in it than my left shoe. Because anything that comes from the Lord going to have to come from the Lord. Anything that's the will of God going to have to come from God. He going to have to tell you. You can't make it up. You can't make it up yourself and then put Jesus' name on it and think that God has to honor it. Just because that's what you want to do. Just because everybody told you you were supposed to be a preacher doesn't mean you're a preacher unless the Lord says you're a preacher. Or just because you have an anointing on your voice doesn't mean you're called a pastor. You might be a prophet or you might be an evangelist, okay? You have to ask the Lord. I feel this anointing when I speak. I see the power of God coming out my mouth. What have you called me to do? What is my station? What is my place? What is your will for my life with this anointing that you've given me? You can't make it up and then think that Jesus has to honor it later. He didn't already told you what his response to that going to be, okay? Let's look at another scripture. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25, okay? Matthew chapter 25. Uh, again, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 12. I'm not going to read all of them because uh, we're, we're getting short on time. But anyway, this is the parable of the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. So to sum up this for you, uh, the Lord said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. In this parable, he's talking about physical lamps where you had to put kerosene, what we would call kerosene oil in them to keep them uh, active. And then you had to trim the wax and make sure you weren't overstuffed with oil and overstuffed with wax. That's where we get that old school phrase, keep your lamps trimmed and burning. That's where that comes from. So in the story... There's uh, five wise virgins who kept their lamps ready and five virgins who let their lights go out. They ran out of oil. So they asked the five wise virgins, give us some of your oil. And they said, nope, because it won't be enough for us and you. So the five that let their lamps go out went to buy some, uh, some oil somewhere else. And the five wise virgins took their oil with them in their lamps. 
Then the bridegroom came in the middle of the night while the foolish ones were out there trying to get some oil and they went in the house and shut the door. And so what the Lord is trying to show you in that parable is oil in the Bible is a representation, is an analog for the Holy Spirit. The Lord is trying to show in that principle, in that, in that parable, that people that stay spirit-filled and stay in step with him are ready to move on with him when God is ready to move. And people that aren't filled with the Holy Ghost and are somewhere outside the will of the God, outside the will of God trying to catch up, they miss him. So the Lord moves on to something else, shuts the door to that opportunity, and moves forward with the people that were ready because they stay filled with the Holy Ghost. And people that are casual and lax with their relationship with God and don't stay spirit filled and ready are going to miss the move of God. Um, and then. Uh, it says in verses 10, 11, and 12, I will re we'll read those. And while they went to buy, that's the foolish versions. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. How many people have missed a move of God because you didn't say you didn't stay spirit filled, you didn't stay full of the Holy Ghost, you didn't stay in step with the Lord. You went off somewhere, off doing your own thing, and while you was off doing your own thing, the Lord moved, shut the door, moved forward, and you come up later talking about what happened. How many Christians has that happened to? It happens all the time. You know why? Because you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You just got religion. You just got religion. You don't have relationship with the Lord. Okay? That's why you got that casual attitude that makes you think you can just go off and do whatever. You don't have to stay spirit-filled. You don't have to stay ready. Okay? Because the Bible says that the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. They were ready. They were spirit-filled. They were in tune with the Spirit. So when the Lord came, when the Lord showed up, they were ready to go. That's the only way you can stay in step with Christ if you, is if you stay spirit-filled every day. That's Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, 5.19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, uh, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay? So what that means is that you got to stay spirit-filled every day. Because when the Lord is ready to move and when God speaks to you about something, you got to be ready to hear his voice. That means you got to stay ready. You can't be off somewhere doing your own thing and a bit more spirit filled. That's what hap happened to Samson. That's why Samson died early. He died early because he got out of the will of God. He took his anointing for granted. He started living so carnally and so much in the flesh until the anointing lifted off of him. And when it was time for him to fight his enemies, Delilah had cut his hair and his strength was gone because he broke his covenant with God. And what happened? He got captured by his enemies. They gouged his eyes out. They blinded him. They made fun of him. They spit on him. And then they hung him between two pillars and they mocked him. And how many times in life do we get defeated by the devil because we, we broke our walk with God? God told us to do something and stay the course. And we said, nope. And then the devil caught us out there and humiliated us. How many times does that happen? See what I mean? Because the Lord is a person, not a set of rules. It's not religion. You can't just pick some behaviors and do them over and over again. That's what a lot of people do and say, well, I'm all right with God because I do this. He's a person, not a set of rules. Okay? So let's move on because I want to be sure to get this in. Now, here's something I've been wanting to say a long time. This is another thing when I was growing up. I wish the preachers had said this from the pulpit. This is how people get full of genie concept because they don't tell you what I'm about to tell you now. And here's principle number three. So principle number one was God promise you, promises you what, but you can't tell him how. Principle number two is you got to hear his voice for yourself. If you don't know the voice of the Lord, you're going to miss his will. Okay. And number three, here's principle number three. I've been wanting to say this since I was a little boy. God deals with everybody differently. Good gravy from the name. God deals with everybody differently. 
I can't tell you how many times I've seen people get up in church and give their testimony and say, the Lord said this, and the Lord did this, and the Lord did that, and the Lord did this, and the Lord did that, and you hear that, and it sounds really great. And then you think the Lord going to deal with you that way and fail, okay? Just because somebody got up and gave their testimony and said, the Lord dealt with me such and such a way, does not mean the Lord is going to deal with you that way. And I can prove that by scripture. Um, Gideon, Judges 6, uh, uh, 11 is actually where the story starts. But I just want to touch on that a little bit because I'm running out of time. In Judges 6, 11, uh, it says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree, which is an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the uh, Bizzurite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Uh, then we're going to skip down. And, uh, right, pray unto thee, right. And then verse 22 says, And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. You know what that means? That means that the children of Israel understood that you can't see angels and you can't see the face of God and you see a heavenly visitor face to face, you're going to die. That's what Gideon was expecting to happen. And the angel said to him, peace be unto you, fear not, that shall not die. It's not going to happen this time. Why? Because that's the way God was dealing with him. God let him see an angel and not die. That don't mean God going to deal that way with you. That's the way the Lord dealt with Gideon. Let me show you some other scriptures. Okay. Uh, Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Okay? Fourth book in the Old Testament, fourth book in the Bible. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of the Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out to the tent meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. Wow. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. God stripped all the pigment out of Miriam's skin for talking about Moses' wife and talking against Moses. What did the Lord say? The Lord said, if there's a prophet among you, I'm going to give him a vision. I'm going to give him a dream. The Lord said, that's how I speak to him. But he said, with Moses, it's not so. He said, Moses, I speak with him face to face. God came down and told Moses, because Miriam and Aaron were Moses' brother and sister, if you didn't know that. God came down and rebuked Moses' siblings for talking about him and the woman he married. And God said, I talked to this man face to face. You should have been afraid to speak against him. And then God cursed Miriam with leprosy and stripped all the pigment out of her skin. And she, she white as snow. Why? Because the Lord said, if there's a regular prophet among you, he's going to get a vision or he or she going to get a vision, he or she going to get a dream. But Moses, me and him got a different relationship. Me and him speak face to face. And you should have had more respect for the man of God than to be talking about him like that because I speak to him face to face. Look at that. Okay? So what's my point there? Because I need to wrap up. My point there is what I told you before. You can't be trying to tell God how he's going to deal with you. That's up to him. Okay? Because if you are an apostle, God calls you face to face. Jesus called his 12. He appeared to Apostle Paul and blinded him and knocked him 
off the, uh, the, knocked him off the donkey. Okay? He appeared to Moses the first time in the burning bush. Because when you're an apostle or prophet, the Lord calls you face to face. If you don't have that call or that experience, you ain't got no business talking about people that do. Just because God don't deal with you that way doesn't mean he doesn't deal with anybody that way. Okay? Because if you have an apostolic call or prophetic call, the scriptures teach that God going to call you face to face because he will. And if you don't, he might not deal with you that way. He might deal with you, as he said, in dreams and visions. Some people feel the leading of God in their heart. Some people have a knowing in their spirit. Some people, uh, like Apostle John, had an open vision in the book of Revelation. Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10 had an open vision. Okay, but however the Lord deals with you, that's the way God deals with you. And you have to ask the Lord, how are you dealing with me? Because you got to know his voice for yourself, but he's going to deal with you the way he deal with you. And I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people get up. I'm talking about preachers, too. Get up in the pulpit and they talk about all the stuff they had. And then people in the congregation get this idea that just because God dealt with them that way, that he's going to deal with you that way. Mm -mm -mm. He's going to deal with you however he deals with you. And that's between him and you. And ain't nobody got their business putting their mouth on that. Ain't nobody got no business criticizing what kind of relationship the Lord, if the Lord has chosen to deal with you, that's between you and him. And I don't have nothing to do with that. And you need to respect that and stay away from that. And just ask Jesus Christ, how you going to deal with me? That's all you got to worry about. Speak to me. Tell me what you want me to do. That's all you got to worry about. Okay? So to recap our lesson for tonight, uh, this is number four in my series of No More Genies. And uh, point number one is God promises you, uh, if God makes you a promise, that's the what. But you can't tell God how. <laughs> You can't tell God how he's going to make his promise come to pass. And we looked at several scriptures about how the Lord healed in various and sundry ways. You can't tell God how to do it. Okay. Uh, number two, you got to hear his voice for yourself. He said, my sheep know my voice. You got to know the voice of the Lord for yourself. That's why you need the prophetic in your life. Okay. You got to know what Jesus is saying to me. And point number three, God deals with everybody differently. So if I give my testimony and I talk about how the Lord was dealing with me, I want you to be edified and I want you to be encouraged, but I don't want you to think you're going to duplicate that experience. That's how he's dealing with me and vice versa. When I listen to your testimony, I want to be edified. I want to be encouraged. I want to be strengthened in my face, but that don't mean he's going to deal that way with me. He's going to deal with me the way he deal with me and he's going to deal with you the way he deal with you. And that ain't nobody's business, but you and him. So don't be talking about folks when they give their testimony just because you haven't had that experience with the Lord. Get your own experiences with the Lord. That's your job. Okay? All right. So again, wrapping up for tonight, I've been talking about No More Genies, and I want you to listen to this whole thing. If you didn't hear me live, I want you to listen to this whole thing because earlier in the hour, I talked about a couple that let their baby die, and now they're facing felony murder charges because they thought they could tell the Lord how to heal the baby. And that's not the first time. You can look up, you can Google, look up plenty of cases where people have let their children die because they decided God had to heal them a certain way. But I, I pulled up the cases in the news today. In the news today, I mean, they're being arraigned and they're being brought up on felony murder because they let their baby die. Because they thought that they could tell God how to heal the baby. Mm -mm, Lord Jesus. You got to hear his voice for yourself because God might be saying, go to the hospital. God might be saying, take your medicine. God might be saying, change your diet. God might be saying, lose some weight. God might be saying, you're too stressed out. That's why you can't lose weight. God might be saying, get some more sleep. Okay? The Lord's going to speak to you because he is a person, not a set of rules, because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship, okay? So that's why I'm always so strong on teaching No More Genie. So God bless you. Uh, we're going to close with a word of prayer. If anybody has any prayer requests, throw them on the screen now, and I'll pray for you before we go, okay? All right, the Spirit of God has given me a prophetic word, so I'm going to release a prophetic word. 
And if there are no prayer requests, we're going to close in prayer. For thus saith the Lord, you've heard the words of my prophet. Believe me, my people, believe the scriptures and believe the word of the man of God. Seek me for yourself. Seek my face. Seek to get to know me for yourself and learn my voice. For I am the good shepherd and I have given my life for the sheep. And I give my life for the sheep. I will give you the life that you seek. I will give you life more abundantly. When you learn my voice, when you believe me, when you trust me and you obey me, I will guide you step by step. I will give you daily bread. For I love you and I long to fellowship with you. I long for us to be intimate. I long for you to know me as I know you. And as you learn my voice and learn of me, I will lead you to green pastures and still waters, said the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Amen. That bless my soul. So I want to encourage those of you that are watching to do what the Holy Ghost just said do and seek Jesus Christ and his voice and his face for yourself. Okay? All right. We're going to close with a word of prayer. Thank you so much, those of you that tuned in live. And I ask you to please like and share because, like I told you in the, in the beginning of the hour, we got people about to go to jail for the rest of their lives because they let their baby die because of genie concept. That's how important it is that we break the spirit of genie concept among the body of Christ, but also for the world, for saints and sinners. Prayers for open ears, please, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, as Sister Victoria has said, Lord, I ask you to open the ears of everyone watching this broadcast, both live and people that are going to watch on the replay. And everybody, Lord, that's serious about seeking your face, I ask you to speak to them in the way you're going to deal with them. Open their ears, O oh God, so they have ears to hear what you have to say. And however it is you deal with them, O oh God, that's none of our business. You decide how you're going to deal with us. And Lord, we're just grateful that you deal with us at all. We're just grateful that you talk to us, Lord, because we cannot live without you. We cannot make it without you. We need your voice. We need your word, oh God. So please give us open ears so that we might hear the voice of Christ however it manifests. And as we have spent time in your written word so we can understand the living word, Jesus Christ, and obey you and believe you when we hear you. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. So yeah, so amen. That blessed me. So like I said, uh, please uh, like and share. Please let people know that we don't want uh, any more people letting their children die because they think they get to tell God how to heal them and because they think they don't have to do the things in the natural like nurse the baby, like feed the baby, like you know, make sure the baby is not too warm, not too cold. We don't want any more of that. That's genie concept. I told you. I told you genie concept messes people up dead baby going to jail for the rest of their life 27 years old so please like and share this video and please like and share this series because we want to be sure that we see god's face and we understand him as a person and not as a genie and we can't rub the magic lamp and we can't say a magic word and we can't make up our own good works we have to hear our instructions from the voice of the lord personally and do whatever it is the lord is telling us personally to do. Okay? That's how we get blessed. And that's how we become above only, not beneath. All right? God bless you again. Thank you so much for those of you that tuned in live and for those of you that are watching the broadcast uh, 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 on replay. I encourage you to watch it from the beginning so you can get all the information that was shared tonight. Okay? So I will be on again this Sunday live at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my weekly prophetic word. And then my next No More Genies broadcast is going to be next month in September. And that will be September. Pulling the calendar up. That's going to be September.